If you're just getting started in Unity, then it's likely that so far you've been putting most of your game's logic in update, which is called every frame, which for behaviours that take place during each frame is absolutely fine. However, only using update can make it tricky to manage logic that happens over an extended period of time. For example, if you want to fade something in or fade something out, or if you want to perform a series of tasks one after the other, or if you want to stall a function for a number of seconds, trying to do that inside of update can be very difficult. But there's an easier way by using a coroutine. In this video, you'll learn what a coroutine is, how it works, and when you should use one. So what exactly is a coroutine in Unity? Unlike update, which processes code on a frame by frame basis, a coroutine in Unity allows you to execute game logic over a number of frames. This works because coroutines, unlike regular functions, are able to pause their operation until the next frame, allowing you to split a function's logic into a number of steps that take place over a period of time, instead of all at once. But how is this useful? Let's say that I want to give an object a series of instructions, such as this tank, for example. What if, when I click on the map, I want the tank to turn to face where I've clicked, move to that position, wait a second, then fire? It's entirely possible to do this in update, but it can be very tricky. In update, each frame is new, so to do something over a number of frames typically involves finding a way to keep track of what has already happened and what needs to happen next. Meaning that if I want to process a series of steps in update, I'd need to use different Boolean values just so I knew which step the tank was on right now. And while it's possible to work like that, it can be unintuitive and inefficient. A coroutine, however, works kind of like a to-do list. Unity executes the coroutine function in order, just like a regular method in update, except that, unlike update, it's able to pause what it's doing during one frame and pick up where it left off in the next, which can make it much, much easier to execute a series of actions in order. So how do you write a coroutine? In Unity, coroutines are created using the iEnumerator return type, followed by the name of the function and any data you want to allow to be passed in. Variables you create inside the coroutine will persist for its duration, meaning that just like cached variables at the top of a class, variables in a coroutine can be used over a period of time. The main difference between a coroutine and a regular function is that a coroutine can be suspended between frames, allowing you to create functionality that takes place over a period of time. This works by using different types of yield statement, which allow you to instruct the coroutine to stop what it's doing until the next frame, five seconds later, or until something else has happened, after which the coroutine will continue where it left off. So what are the different types of yield statements? One of the most common yield statements you're likely to use is yield return null, which suspends execution of a coroutine until the next frame. When used inside of a conditional statement, yield return null can be used to create many update loops inside of coroutines. What's happening here is that the while loop is processed over and over until the conditional statement is no longer true, allowing the rest of the code, if there is any, to be executed. Now, if you were to do this in update without yield return null, it would all happen in the same frame. What's different in a coroutine is that the yield statement interrupts the function and pauses it until the next frame. So the function still works in exactly the same way, except the logic is split over a number of frames instead of one. This is useful as it allows you to create multiple conditional loops that can be run one after the other. Going back to the tank example, this is ideal for turning the tank until it's in position, then moving it afterwards until it reaches its target point. Then, once the tank reaches its position, if I want to wait for a second before doing anything else, I can by using wait for seconds. Wait for seconds, or wait for seconds real time, which uses unscaled time, is an easy way to delay a function by a number of seconds while it's running. To use it, simply type yield return new wait for seconds and then pass in the amount of time you want the function to wait for in seconds. Then, instead of pausing until the next frame, the coroutine will wait for a number of seconds before proceeding. Again, it's entirely possible to do something like this in update instead of using a coroutine. You can delay the start of a function using invoke or it's possible to repeat a function using invoke repeating. Or to pause a function halfway through, you could create a timer and measure an amount of time using delta time in a similar way to wait for seconds. However, if you need to pause a function for an amount of time, chances are it's because you want to do one thing, wait a moment, and then do something else. 
which in update, where everything happens all at once, can be much harder to manage. Whereas because a coroutine remembers where it was, performing sequential tasks with gaps in between can be much easier to do in a coroutine. Other yield statements include wait for end of frame, which will suspend the coroutine function until the end of the frame event message is called. Why would you want to do that? While update and even late update both happen before rendering, using wait for end of frame will suspend the function until after the scene is rendered. This can be useful for making sure the frame is actually finished before doing something with the image, such as taking a screenshot. There's also the wait until and wait while statements, which work in a similar way to using a while loop with a yield return null statement, except that they allow you to use a delegate function in place of a conditional check. Or it's possible to make one coroutine wait for another. Using yield return start coroutine allows you to wait while another coroutine completes, after which the coroutine that called it will continue from where it left off. However, if you're going to start a coroutine inside of another coroutine, now would probably be a good time to explain how to start one. There are two main ways of starting a coroutine. You can start a coroutine using its string by passing in the name of the coroutine that you want to trigger. This optionally will allow you to pass in one parameter into the coroutine function. Or you can start a coroutine by referencing it directly in the same way that you would call a function. And in most cases, this is generally the better way to do it. This is because it's slightly more efficient to do it this way and it also allows you to cache a reference to the coroutine you just started. So this works by declaring a coroutine variable and setting it with the start coroutine function, which will both start the coroutine and cache a reference to it, which can be useful when you want to stop it. How do you stop a coroutine? A coroutine will stop automatically once it reaches the end of its code. So there's no need to explicitly stop a coroutine unless you want to cancel it or end it early, in which case there are two main ways to do that externally or from within the coroutine itself. Using yield break from inside the coroutine will end it on that line, which can be useful for creating conditions within the coroutine function that can be used to exit out of it. When you start writing a coroutine, you'll usually see an error straight away, informing you that not all code paths return a value. This is because of the return type of a coroutine, but put simply, it just means that you will need to use a yield statement at some point in your code. Which makes sense, because if you're not suspending the function in some way, there's no point in using a coroutine anyway. If you'd like to avoid this error while you're writing the coroutine, just add yield break to the end of your code. Remember, however, there's no need to add this, since a coroutine will end when it reaches the end of its code block anyway. It's just a simple way of hiding the error while you're writing the code. If you want to cancel a coroutine externally, the stop coroutine function is one way to do that. So just type stop coroutine and pass in the coroutine you want to stop. You might typically use this before triggering a coroutine as if there's a chance that the coroutine you want to start is already running, stop coroutine can prevent you from triggering multiple instances of the same coroutine. However, this only works if you have a reference to the coroutine that's running and only if that reference has been set, otherwise you'll get a null error. So to prevent that, I can just wrap this in an if condition. In some cases, however, it can simply be easier just to stop everything using the stop all coroutines function. Stop all coroutines will stop any and all coroutines that were triggered by the script that it is used on, meaning that it won't affect other coroutines in your game, only the ones that were called by the script that you trigger the function on. But what about if you call a coroutine in another script? Stop all coroutines applies to the script that triggered the coroutine, not the script that the coroutine itself is written in. So for example, if you use one script to start a coroutine from a different script, using stop all coroutines on the first script will stop it, while using it on the second script won't stop anything. This happens because coroutines are tied to the script that first triggered them. For example, destroying the object that started the coroutine will end it, but destroying the object with the script that the coroutine is written in won't. Whenever you want to break up a function so that it takes place over a number of frames or over a period of time, a coroutine is usually going to be a good option for doing that. However, while they can be very useful for their intended purpose, they can sometimes be more trouble than they're worth if you try to use them in the wrong way. So what's the best way to use coroutines? Most of the time, it's a good idea to avoid overlapping coroutines. Just like with any function, it's possible to trigger multiple coroutines of the same type so that several are running all at once. However, unless this is the behavior you want, 
triggering multiple coroutines can be confusing. And if your coroutine is designed to do something to just one object, such as fade it in or move it, for example, accidentally running more than one at the same time is going to cause you problems. For this reason, if your coroutine is designed to be used one at a time, it's usually a good idea to stop all coroutines before starting a new one. Secondly, coroutines work best as set and forget functions. What does that mean? It means that while coroutines are good for staging a function over a period of time, they're not a great fit for dynamic functionality that changes in response to other factors, such as artificial intelligence, for example. Take the tank example from earlier in this video. A coroutine works with this because it's a linear function, staged over a period of time. When the player clicks, the tank turns, then moves, then waits, then fires. However, if the tank was controlled by an AI that would sometimes turn, move, wait, or fire, depending on the actions of the player, then a coroutine probably isn't a good fit for that, and you may be better off with some kind of behaviour tree or state machine instead. Put simply, coroutines are still linear functions, they just happen over an extended period of time. Lastly, while coroutines can be great for splitting logic up across frames, it's not the only method for doing that. Async await in Unity allows you to perform tasks asynchronously, and while the results can be similar, it's a different kind of workflow to coroutines. Coroutines work like any other function, the only difference is that they have stopping points that suspend their operation between frames. Asynchronous operations, however, work in the background, parallel to other tasks. One of the main practical differences of async await when compared to coroutines is that coroutines can't return data, but async await can. Practically, this makes async await more suitable for managing multiple tasks at once whether that's sequentially, so one after the other, or in parallel, where you might trigger multiple tasks at the same time. For more information on async await and when you might use it, see the link in the video description. So now I want to hear from you. Do you use coroutines in your game? Have they helped you or have they caused more problems than they've solved? And what's your best coroutines advice that you know others will find helpful? Whatever it is, let me know by leaving a comment below. Remember to like this video if you found it useful and get subscribed for more videos from me. I'll see you next time.